Welcome to the continuing lecture on Chapter 6 of our textbook. Uh, when we uh, began Chapter 6, we covered about the first five slides. Let me just do a little refresher for those of y'all that might have missed it. If you missed any of these answers, I'm going to put them on the screen so you can pause the presentation to make sure you have the answers written down. And I believe that we are up to chapter, excuse me, slide seven, which is the case reporting system. The um, publisher who does most of the reporters, and that's what the case reporting system is typically called, is West. Um, you can see uh, cases in a, in a variety of ways, but the most common is to use the reporter for your particular state. Texas shares a reporter with several other states. Tennessee, Missouri, Kentucky. It doesn't make a lot of sense geographically, but the reporters call <coughs> the Southwestern reporters. So, and at least it doesn't make so much sense for Kentucky, but it makes sense for Texas that we are in the Southwestern reporter. About half the cases that are reported in the Southwestern reporter are Texas cases because we're a much more populated state than the ones that we share uh, the reporter with. Um, you will very commonly find in Texas that Instead of getting the whole Southwestern Reporter, you will have the Texas cases of the Southwestern Reporter. Um, so in that sense, because only about half the cases are Texas cases, typically the Southwestern Reporter Texas cases will actually publish two volumes in one book. And there will be, of course, page gaps that might jump from page 300 to page 417 or something um, to reflect the fact that those 117 pages that are missing were actually pages that covered Kentucky or Tennessee or some other state that's not Texas. And so that's how the Southwestern Reporter System for Texas cases works. That is how, um, that is the type of uh, reporter that we have in our library on the Spring Creek campus. And it's very common. Uh, you can certainly see them in which they are a full reporter, including all the states, not just Texas. But in Texas, it's very common to have that uh, reduced reporter. Obviously, a reporter system presents primary sources. These are the actual published opinions that the judges have written. Um, they, the opinions themselves have no editorial content from West, uh, but there are a variety of finding aids that are interspersed with the actual cases. And that is one of the reasons why the uh, West Reporter Series is so popular, because it, in addition to publishing the cases, it provides some helpful tools to understanding and locating um, relevant cases. Um, so um, let's talk about the secondary tools that you'll find in a Southwestern reporter or any West reporter. Before the published opinion, there will be something that is typically called the syllabus. It's a short summary about the case. It kind of gives an overview in one paragraph or so what happened in the case. It can be a quick place to read to see, hey, I thought this case might be interesting, but let me glance at what it's about. And, and many times when you do that, you realize, oh, Jesus, this really isn't information that I need. It, it's on the same topic, but it's, it's approaching it from a different standpoint or it's covering a different aspect of this topic, and I don't need to go farther. I like to call this kind of triaging it. I, I'll do that quick review, and, and then it, I'll put a case in either um, – Good to know, but of, a, of secondary importance. Looks like it might be really on target. And then the third is not useful. So I, that's kind of my system. You might have a more refined system to doing it, but something along those lines is pretty common. So once you've made that first cut, when, but looking at the syllabus, then you're probably going to go to your keynotes. Um, and they will cover, um, uh, where before we talked about the key number system, which breaks up the law um, into about a hundred, over 100 thousand different nuggets or bites or, or grains of law, and each one of those has its unique number. Well, each one of those units will be separated in the uh, key numbers before the opinion. It'll tell you what of those granules of law are actually covered in this opinion. Now, this is obviously something that the court doesn't do. It's what the West editors are doing. And West usually does a very good job at deciding which issues are being covered in this opinion or not. And then below the, the key number, there will be a short summary of what the court actually said on that particular issue. So if you've decided that you have some interest in the case because the syllabus seems potentially useful, 
the next step that many people go to is actually looking at the key numbers, seeing if the topics that are covered there seem on point and the little excerpts or little summaries of what the judge says about it are also on point. There will be a number next to each key number that will refer you to a particular paragraph or section of the published opinion. So let's say there's something in the, uh, the key number, you say, yeah, oh, that looks like that might be what I need to look at. Then you would say, ah, oh, that's number seven. So then you flip to the opinion and find where the number seven in brackets is, and then you'll actually be able to read the opinion to see if, yes, it is useful, or maybe, no, it's not so much useful. So those are the most important tools that West provides in addition to actually presenting the published opinion. Now, the published opinion can't be copyrighted. After all, you and I as taxpayers pay the judge's salary, and the judge, of course, can't copyright his own work because he's, he's doing it as a public servant. So the part that is copyrighted is all those extra goodies that West produces. But the actual opinion isn't um, copyrighted, and um, it, it's a, a resource that anybody can use. You can find these opinions in other vehicles. One would be online. You can find these opinions. Um, but, of course, you're not going to get, unless you use the, the Westlaw online resource, you're not going to be able to get the editorial aspects of it, which, frankly, um, are very helpful in finding cases and quickly understanding cases. So um, it, it, you're sacrificing a lot when you give up those editorial tools. Um, and you can also find uh, the cases published in other resources in official reporters many cases. Now, Texas doesn't have an official reporter. The only reporter that we have in Texas is the unofficial reporter, which is the West reporter. When I say it's unofficial, that sounds like it's a little fly-by-night or something you really ought not be using, but that's not true at all. Um, the unofficial reporter is every bit as good, every bit as respected as the official reporter. And I would even say that the unofficial West reporter is actually more widely available, more known, more recognized than the official reporters in states that have official reporters. Texas discontinued its official report in the 1960s, and I think they made a good decision because it was typically states who have maintained official reporters find that it actually costs the state money because most people who, pub, who buy the reporters are going to buy the West reporter because they can get more bang for their buck. They can get that editorial content, and they can also get maybe some some cases from other states. So um, the fact that we don't have an official reporter is no slam on Texas. It's probably a good business judgment for the state legislature to make. So that's an overview of how state reporters work. Let me just talk for a second about what is actually in the report, what opinions are published. In Texas, you'll find opinions from the appellate court. In Texas, we have 14 appellate courts. Um, here in, da in the Dallas area, we're in the fifth court of appeals, but there are a total of 14. And then we also have two highest courts, the Texas Supreme Court and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. So we have a total of 16 courts um, that can be published in the state reporters. Let me pause for a second. Some of people get confused about this. When I say there are 14 courts of appeal, I don't mean that there are 14 judges. Each one of those courts of appeal has multiple, multiple judges and, in fact, multiple courthouses. So when I say there's 16 courts, um, there's lots more than 16 courthouses that we're talking about. Um, the court reporters only publish appellate or higher court opinions. They do not publish trial court opinions. So a district court in the state of Texas is not going to have any published opinions in the reporter system. And it's very rare that you'll find those opinions really in any type of publication system. Let's look at the Southwest report. This is how it's designated. S period, W period, and then there will be the number for the um, edition of it. And, of course, there's some Southwestern, Southwestern 2nd, Southwestern 3rd. We're in the Southwestern 3rd right now, um, and that just means that you know, they, they kind of run out of number, that uh, 999 Southwest 2nd, the next line is going to be 1 Southwest 3rd or something along those lines. Our uh, collection in the, on the Spring Creek campus is pretty complete with respect to the Southwestern reporters for Texas. So if you want to go to the library and... Um, look at that, kind of get familiar with what the resources look like. That might be a good investment of your time. Let's go to the next one. Let's look at the citation um, terminology and, and the format that is used. When you take legal research, you'll spend time learning about what's called blue booking. Blue booking is kind of like the MLA that you use when you write um, English papers, but blue booking is kind of the equivalent for law. 
Unlike the MLA, though, which is just really for scholarly resources, the Blue Book is used routinely for anything that you um, do that you might file with the court or even internal memoranda. Um, it's a very common resource. The emphasis that a law firm will put on having correct Blue Book form really varies. And typically, it's the larger the law firm, the more likely it is that they will be focused on you know, do you have the right spacing? Do you have the right abbreviations? Do you have the right format? Um, but there are some small law firms, perhaps breakaways from larger law firms, that do have a kind of a traditionalist approach to blue booking. So it's a useful skill to have, and you'll, again, you'll learn more about that in legal research. Um, but I don't want to oversell it. There's plenty of, of law firms that, um, unless you're filing it, say, in an appellate court, blue booking is maybe a little bit more informal. Um, but I, I encourage you to at least um, learn uh, how to use the blue book so when you're in a situation where you need to get it right, you will be able to get it right. Text is a little unusual because we not only have the blue book, the blue book is a national resource. Almost all courts in the 50 states are going to use the blue book formatting. It's actually a, a, several law schools got together and prepared this resource. And when you see the book, you'll be astonished by how thick it is. And yet, when you start using it, you will quickly find, wait a second, it doesn't answer this question. How can it be this thick and not answer my question? Um, it's not the most user-friendly book, I'll be honest with you. It's better than it once was, but I'm hoping it'll get still better. So that's just a reality check on that. There are some useful finding aids in the book. So if, when you actually are in legal research, spend some time looking at how it's organized um, so that you can use it in a more efficient way. There are some tools. And if you're taking the course with me, of course, we'll go over those in classes. Yeah, in Texas, we don't just have the blue book. We have a book called the Green Book. It's kind of a forest green, and it's significantly thinner than the blue book. But it doesn't replace the blue book. It's an additional resource to address Texas-specific issues. Um, the Green Book is published by the University of Texas Law School, but it, it's used for any law school in Texas. It's not uh, unique to that. It just so happens that our biggest law school is the one that um, helps with, with this resource. Um, the big things about the Green Book is it helps with some Texas-specific abbreviations that aren't addressed in the Blue Book. That's one benefit. Most of those are statutory. And then the second is that it tells us what to do with writ history. The Blue Book um, doesn't talk about Texas state writ history and how to handle that. I realize I'm speaking in foreign language probably for, for you at this point in time. You don't, don't know what writ history is. But um, when you're in legal research, this book will make hopefully a lot more sense. So let's look at an example of the format. The first thing that you see is that there are very specific rules about how you abbreviate things. Um, nationals, capital N, A, T, apostrophe, L, no period. Um, there's no way you can intuit that. It's something that you just learn. And if you spend enough time with this, you'll figure out the abbreviations. But they're not necessarily the standard abbreviations that you would have used if you were just thinking about it on your own. So you really do have to kind of look things up. And after a while, you commit some of them to memory. The second is that I've underlined the name of the case. It can be underlined or italicized. Whatever you do in a document, though, you should be consistent. If you underline one case, you need to underline them all. If you italicize one case, you need to italicize them all. Um, I, I would say, if, if you want kind of a sense about it, the older the attorney is, the more likely he or she is to underline, less likely to italicize. Um, sometimes italics can be... Um, Less obvious, especially depending upon the font. Underlining is always going to be very clear. Um, so, again, I don't have a preference. I, I do both, but and of course, I don't do both the same document. Uh, but those are kind of some rules of thumb. And then there's other rules, and I'm not going to go over all of them. But while people will talk about the blue book and say how arbitrary it is, how difficult it is to use, and I'm not disagreeing with them, uh, one thing in its defense is that it is designed to give you a lot of information. Um, the first number you see here is the volume of the book. So this is the 347th volume of the Southwest Second Reporter. And then this first page, or this first number here, is the page number where the case starts, where you will actually see this heading of, of the case. It may be that no part of the actual opinion appears. It may just be kind of introductory matters. Um, and then this next page is the page that the reader, or, I mean, the writer is drawing your attention to that he or she wants the reader to pay attention to. Sometimes there is no second page, and so basically the court is, or the writer is saying, pay attention to this whole opinion. There's no particular page or pages that are referenced. So 
But in this case, he's saying you'll find the beginning of the case on this page, but the part you're really interested in will be on this page. In the parens, you're going to find the court that, that is deciding. And when you just see TEX, that means the Texas Supreme Court. Um, and then there's abbreviations, Sex Court of Criminal Appeal and all the appellate courts. Um, and then the year of publication. These pieces of information are important because this tells you how seriously you have to take this authority. Well, if it's a matter you're litigating in Texas, you probably ought to take it pretty seriously because it's the Texas Supreme Court. If this were from the Second Court of Appeals and we're in the Fifth Court of Appeals, I wouldn't be as concerned about it because it's not binding on me I'm in the Fifth Court of Appeals. But um, here, this is, of course, binding upon everybody in the state of Texas. And then we have the year of publication. Um, this tells me kind of how recent the case is. And as you can see, this case is quite old. It might be that, particularly this is interpreting the statute, it might be that the statute has changed. And so this law is no longer good, or it could have been overturned in the last, you know, 52 years. So there's a lot of reason to kind of be a little hesitant about a case that's that, that, that is that old. doesn't mean it's bad law, but it does mean you ought to think about it a little bit from that perspective. So here's some just some information. just wanted to kind of expose you to that. Um, let's talk about the federal court system. There are two big reporters for federal cases. The first is called the federal supplement. Now, we talked, when we were talking about the Southwestern Reporter, how trial court opinions are not published in the Southwestern Reporter. But federal court trial opinions are sometimes published. Not most of them, but, but some of them are. And they are published in the federal supplement, which is called FSUP. And I have here, FSUP second. Um, and so uh, trial court opinions on the federal system do get a little bit more attention and more um, focus than they would in a, in a state trial court. Uh, but many of the federal supplement cases are on procedural issues, discovery disputes, um, federal and civil procedure issues, and less so on substantive law. The other big reporter system is the federal reporter, and this covers all the appellate courts. There are 11 numbered federal courts from the first court of appeals to the 11th court of appeals, and two that are designated with letters, the D.C. circuit and the federal circuit. So there's a total of 13. And they are all combined in the federal reporter. So you might have a third court of appeals case followed by a seventh court of appeals case followed by a federal court of appeals case followed by a first court of appeals case. They're arranged generally chronologically, but they're not grouped with all the seventh court of appeals together. They're interspersed. So you, you uh, need a, you, you might find a fifth court of appeals, which is our court of appeals for the whole state of Texas. Louisiana, Mississippi are in that system. You could find it in any particular reporter um, that might be out there. We are now up to F third of the Federal Reporter Third Series. And of course, the U.S. Supreme Court has its own reporter series, and there's actually several ways to find it. We've talked up to this point that I made it sound like official reporters don't get a lot of attention. The one exception is the U.S. Supreme Court official reporter, which is just as in a U.S. or U.S. report. It is published by the federal government. It is the official edition. But having said that, um, it's not better than the other editions. Um, the other one is the, the Supreme Court Reporter, which is the West product. Um, and again, if you're going to be using West law, it's very likely you will be using this citation method. It's not official, but again, just like all the other things we talked about, it's going to have a syllabi, it's going to have a head notes with key numbers. So it's going to provide helping tools that the U.S. reporter doesn't have. And then there's another one which is less frequent to have the lawyer's edition of the Supreme Court report. Um, rarely will you find this anymore. And then there's also the United States Law Week, which is a loosely service. A loosely service is like a three-ring binder. It's a tool that was very popular kind of for legal scholars before the Internet, wherein people would um, manually update these books um, every week or every month or whatever this would be, the time frame for updates for that particular edition was, um, they would come into the library and librarians would take out one page and replace it with a new and improved one. Obviously, you couldn't do this in bound books. The books needed to be in some kind of three-ring binder or four-ring binder or something like that. And um, that's how this U.S. Law Week works. Every week when U.S. Supreme Court opinions are published, um, they will be added, and then when the book is full, they will be uh, bound into that uh, lawyer's edition of the Supreme Court report. And then you'd, you'd empty out all those U.S. law weeks and start the next week with a fresh volume. So that's how that system works. But again, the loose leaf system isn't really very efficient when you can go on the Internet, 
you know, 10 minutes after the U.S. Supreme Court has published its opinion and find the case online. Let's look at the second case that we were just talking about, the Wheeler versus American National Bank of Beaumont. This is the case title. Let me find the case title. It typically will be one entity versus another entity. Um, it might be that Wheeler and 50 other people were suing the National, American National Bank of Beaumont, but usually only the first name on the list is going to be listed on, for this point, and only the first name of this side of this point. Since this is an appellate opinion, we don't know right off the bat whether Wheeler was the plaintiff or whether American National Bank was the plaintiff, and we don't know who was the appellant. We have to actually look at the opinion to tell that. This is the case citation, what comes after the name of the case. If you look up this case, you will see that the case was decided on June 28, 1961. This is listed, again, kind of right under the name of the case. And then there's the syllabus and the head notes, which also include key notes. And you'll find some information. I've copied here the names of the attorneys. Uh, it's rare that this is going to be important for you to know. Uh, for one thing, most of you feel probably dead. <laughs> Um, but if it's a more recent opinion, it's always possible that opposing counsel or even the judge might be listed in the case. Um, or you might, in a rare case, even be interested in contacting the law firm and say, hey, maybe you're, this is a, a well-regarded law firm, or being Bell and uh, Tucker, and call them up and say, hey, I see that y'all litigated this case. What can you tell us about it? Um, you know, that might be appropriate, obviously not for a case published in 1961, but again, in a more recent case, this could be relevant. But usually you just kind of plays over for this. Then there's going to be the name of the judge who has written the opinion. And of course, this is the majority opinion. In this case, the judge's name is Smith. Um, this can be important if, um, uh, uh, number one, that maybe th this judge might be uh, a visiting judge on your panel or you might be in front of him or something. So, you know, obviously it's good to know if, 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 you, if you're in front of the judge who wrote the opinion. Um, but it's also kind of good to know, well, if you know the dynamics of the particular court that you're, you're talking about, um, is is he in the majority now? Is he is his group is faction not in the majority? Um, so it can give you kind of a sense as to where the court is. Of course, that involves a pretty sophisticated knowledge about the court. Um, and of course, we're, we I don't have an example of a head note here, but we talked previously about what head note is. And there's going to be the actual opinion, which word for word will be what Judge. Smith or Justice Smith in this case wrote, it will include the court's conclusion and disposition of the case. So it's going to say how the court's reasoning was, what the court decided. And the disposition of the case is what happens. Is it remanded? Is it overturned? Is it vacated? Is it affirmed? Those types of things. This is an opinion from the, your textbook. Um, and this information that I have posted here is literally directly from your textbook. So don't spend a lot of times you can't read it here clearly, but it kind of breaks down the, the pieces of information that you have. Again, you can see this is the style of the case. One thing I want to say about this is, and this is why the textbook used it, is that it, while it would be better if they had a um, West reporter example, obviously West won't let them publish their uh, uh, intellectual property, their copyrighted material, um, without paying a fee. So they chose to use a, an official reporter, which was just in the public domain and can be used by anyone. But it's a little bit less helpful because it's not going to show us all the neat finding aids. But you can see, first of all, pretty common way it's going to be begun. It's going to give you the style of the case. It's the Boston Housing Authority versus Bridgewaters. So it's going to tell you the course that decided this case, the year of the decision. It gives you two sites. This is called parallel sites. The first site is the official reporters. You can see Massachusetts still has an official reporter, and then it has the West reporter. And so you can see that. Um, the volumes are going to be different and the pages are going to be different, but when you get to the actual opinion, every word in this will match every word in this. And this is the docket number. You almost never need the docket number, um, you know, which is not going to be useful. And this is the syllabus. This is similar to the type of syllabus that you would find in a West opinion. Um, this, this does have involve some intellectual property. Does It's not something provided by the court, but apparently the editors of the official reporter provide them. And this gives the disposition of the case. This explains what happened to it. Now, this isn't always in this location in the um, uh, West series. And then this gives those names of counsel that we talked about before. Not that common that you're going to benefit from that. Then this gives the uh, decision. You can see the name of the judge. You can see in this case it was the chief or chief justice who wrote this opinion. 
Many times opinions will start by giving you either the factual background of the case, what happened, what were the facts that caused somebody to want to sue. Um, but you can see here they start with the procedural background. So this can be flip-flopped. Either way, it's normal, right? And, and some of them, of course, don't even organize it that way. Of course, have a lot of leeway in how they want to organize it. But if they start with the facts, they're just going to tell the story. They're not going to tell every single fact. They're going to focus on the facts that are relevant to their opinion, relevant to the issue before the court. Then there will be procedural background. Many times, unless you are researching a procedural issue, you won't really care um, about the procedural background. But it can be important in a given case. It can tell you, well, you know, what happened in the lower court? Um, number one, understanding procedural background can help you understand the disposition. Because if the court says we're affirming the lower court, well, you need to know what the lower court said that is being affirmed. So um, that is how, or that's the importance of the procedural uh, posture of the case, the procedural background. Then you get to the discussion. Um, and again, sometimes the, the facts can be interspersed with the discussion, because so certainly, um, or at least the court's going to refer to the facts again. And you're going to perhaps have several different issues that the court uh, looks at um, in terms of the facts. So this is just kind of the, the reasoning behind the opinion. And then we have the order at the end. This is the um, holding of the court or the disposition of the court. We vacate the judgment and remand the case to the housing court for further proceedings consistent with opinion. So vacate means they are erasing the judgment. What happened in the lower court is no longer valid law. And we're remanding the case to the housing court, meaning we're sending it back. Um, but we're not saying, hey, housing court, do whatever you want to in this case. We're telling them what to do with the opinion. So this is the disposition. Let's go back to that first. Okay, so you can see here, judgment of appeals court vacated, remanded to housing court. So this is a summary of the same information that we see right here. Okay, so let's talk about the approaches that make sense to interpreting, understanding um, cases that you read. Um, cases fall into a few categories. First thing you may be tempted to do, and sometimes I've been tempted to do it, is to look for cases that agree with my client's perspective. And obviously you want those cases, that's clear. But you also want to find the cases that don't support your client's claim. For one thing, you need to present the law in the area, even if the law isn't necessarily what you wish the law was. You can't just pick and choose cases and say, oh, well, you know, even though my court has followed Rule A, I don't like Rule A, so I'm going to refer the, the, the judge to an opinion out of another court who adopted Rule B. Well, you can certainly reference Rule B and show where it comes from, but you also have to say what the law is in your particular court. You can't hide the ball. For one thing, that's unethical, but perhaps even more important, it's kind of dumb because the other side is going to find that case, and then you'll have egg all over your face because you weren't candid with the court. The court will find out about the law. You want the court to think that you're a person of integrity and that your client has integrity, and uh, then you want to explain to the court why it ought to follow this other idea, even though there's some precedent that isn't so good for you. And it's rare in a case, frankly, that all the cases are good for you or all the cases are bad for you. I mean, that's why there's a lawsuit. There's differences of opinion. So here are some categories that we want to look at. The first is a case on point. Case on point is a case that is a very nice fit for the fact for the case that you're presenting. That's going to have similar facts and similar legal issues. So as you'll have you hear the expression of cases on all fours. Um, it is one that cannot be distinguished. It's so close to the facts of your case that really the, the court is going to be bound by it. For one thing, it's in the same jurisdiction or it's a higher court in that same jurisdiction. So the court is bound by that. It's going to have similar facts, at least the facts that count for, for making the decision. It's going to have uh, similar legal principles. Um, and so th those are some things that are going to be in common. So it's highly relevant. Obviously, if you find a case on all fours that's good for you, you've probably won your case. If you find a case on all fours that's bad for you, eh, you probably lost your case. You can't change the law, but you're stuck with the facts there, but maybe that means it's a good time to settle. Maybe you'll, you'll find the case before the other side finds the case, and maybe you can give settlement. So a case on point is highly good, and a case on point is just one even better than that. Let's talk about binding authority. A binding authority is not just book binding. It has to do with, you know, if your arms are bound, you're, you are limited, you are forced to do something. 
Well, that's what a binding authority is. It limits the court's opportunity. The court has to follow that opinion, whether the court agrees with it or not. Um, the court must follow, and usually we're talking about case law, but it could be constitution or statutes or regulations. The court has no leeway about this, has to follow it. And typically the court has to follow authorities of courts that are higher than it is um, in that same jurisdiction. So a fifth court of appeals for the state of Texas has to follow the Texas Supreme Court. It doesn't have to follow the Oklahoma Supreme Court, and it doesn't have to follow a tenth court of appeals in the state of Texas. Um, so a, a sister court of the same level or a, a higher court in a different jurisdiction is not bound by but it is bound by courts that it kind of quote-unquote reports up to. Persuasive authorities are different than binding authorities. When I hear persuasive authorities, I think to myself, oh, that sounds like, boy, you really have to follow those authorities. But it actually means the reverse. And a persuasive authority is only as per persuasive as the arguments presented are. So the, um, the court is not bound by fo to follow a persuasive authority. And, and it's only going to follow it if, if it, in fact, is persuaded by the authority. These could be court opinions from other jurisdictions, for example, um, a decision out of the state of Oklahoma, or uh, uh, maybe from a law review article that the court does not follow. So don't be um, tricked by the term persuasive. It's in contrast to binding authority. Let's look at the structure of cases. Um, cases are kind of their own type of literature. Just like if you've never read a poem before, you kind of don't know what to do with it. You know, why are the ends of each line jagged like that? And why are they rhyming? And, you know, what about this meter thing? You know, if you don't have a context for understanding it, you're going to be a little bit thrown off base and, and not really have the tools to make sense of it. And so similarly to iambic pentameter or sonnet or some other writing format, if you don't know what you're looking at when you look at a case, you're likely to be frustrated and confused. You're still going to be frustrated and confused. I'm not going to lie to you. Reading cases is not the easiest thing ever. But um, having some tools to do it is going to make it a little bit less dreadful. So the first thing I recommend when you look at cases is just look at the structure. Find the syllabus. Find the head notes. Um, look at how the actual opinion is organized. And many times the judge will use headings. So he'll have facts of the case, procedural history of the case, argument. He may even break down the argument into maybe there's three big discussion areas he's looking at and holding of the case. He may give you a lot of structure um, so that you can make sense of it. But it's good to look through and see the structure. If you know, there's several issues raised in the opinion and you really only care about one, look at the key numbers to make sure you're focusing on the right areas of the case. Once you've looked at the overall structure, obviously you're going to want to read the case, and you're probably going to want to read it several times, especially if it's an area of the law that you're not that familiar with, or you don't have a lot of experience reading opinions. Um, people, when they're reading opinions, will mark them up, many times people copy them, will mark them up with highlighters and pins and all kinds of things, just like a textbook that they might be working on. Another thing to keep in mind is what's called dicta. Dicta um, is a Latin term meaning spoken, also in plural, I guess it could, uh, dicta is plural, dictum is a singular example of dicta. Um, and it's presented in contrast to the holding of the case. So let's first of all talk about holding and then talk about what isn't holding, what is dicta. A holding is what the decision is with respect to the litigants. It analyzes the fact of their case. So imagine that I punch Mary in the nose. Um, and let's say before I punched Mary in the nose, Mary had said to me, your mother wears army boots, and I punched her in the nose. Well, the court would consider whether Mary's words were sufficiently provocative to somehow excuse my decision to punch her in the nose. And let's say the court concludes that, no, those words were not sufficiently provocative to excuse my punch in the nose, but it's imaginable that there could be terms that are sufficiently provocative, just not these terms. So that's the holding of the case. Saying the words, your mother wears army boots, does not... Um, rise to the level of creating a, 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 a right to punch that person in the nose. That would be the holding of the case. It's restricted to those facts. That's what the litigants litigated. Those are the arguments they presented. That's what the court um, heard and was able to fully analyze the issues surrounding that. Dict is a different one. In the court opinion, the, the court who is deciding this case where I punched Mary in the nose, 
might well have given several hypotheticals. They might have said, well, what if Mary, instead of saying, Groover, your mother wears army boots, had said, Groover, your mother is a harlot. Well, that's pretty strong. That's much stronger than your mother wears army boots. Wears army boots. And so under those situations, the, the court might have said, well, that is sufficiently provocative. Uh, somebody who says that to another person should kind of expect that they might get punched in the nose. So, uh, you know, if that had been the fact of the case, we'd excuse Groover's punch in the nose. But, of course, that wasn't the fact of this case. And in truth, I, Groover, didn't litigate those particular facts, didn't present all the arguments pro and con for that, and neither did Mary because those weren't the facts of the case. They don't, neither Mary nor I care about who wins that case because it's not the one that we're litigating here today. The court is providing that just to explain kind of the scope and its reasoning and how it got to where it is and um, how broad the, the, the decision ought to be interpreted. Um, but it's dicta. It's not the actual opinion in this particular court decision. So it's not, doesn't have the same force that, um, excuse me, that um, uh, w w would happen with the holding. And because it hasn't really been litigated and vigorously argued, it is not given the same weight. You can cite dicta in an opinion. In fact, you oftentimes will. But it, you need to make it clear that this is dicta. Um, that it is, is not the controlling part of the case. When we talked before about binding precedents, only the holding is binding. Dicta is not binding. Now, of course, dicta from, Texas, from a recent Texas Supreme Court opinion, while it's not binding, a lower court's going to say, ah, that's probably where the, US, the Texas Supreme Court's going to go, so I'd be foolish not to follow that trend. Um, so there's levels, I guess, of dicta from that perspective. Here are some ways to look at cases. Just a little bit. Okay. You're going to list the citation, the name of the case, and where to find it, the facts, the procedural history. How did the case get before this court? What were the steps? The issue, and of course, you very likely will have more than one issue. So you issue the, uh, the issue, describe the decision and the reasoning, and then you might have you know, issue one, where you do that too, then you do issue two. That you do that too, then you do issue three, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll end with the holding of the disposition of the case, the one that sums up what's happening here. That's one way to approach it. A very popular means is called, it's called Iraq. I know that's not the way we pronounce the country, Iraq, but uh, for this you will call it Iraq. And as you can see, it's not a Q at the end, it's a C. You start with the issue, you describe the rule of law. So let's say the issue is, going back to my parent punching Mary in the nose, the issue might be, um, what, uh, was Groover's punch in the nose excused by Mary's uh, defamatory statement? That might be the issue. So you describe the rule um, of law, what exists currently in the law, either statutory or case law. Then you would apply the facts, exactly what Mary said, exactly what I did in response, to that rule of law. And this is oftentimes called analysis. It can also be called application. And then that will lead you to the conclusion. No, Mary's comments are not nice. We're not sufficiently provocative to justify the punch in the nose. And then there might be a second issue that you do this through, and a third issue, and a fourth issue. So this is something, especially when you go to law school, this is a popular method for briefing cases. But even when you're not um, deciding to go to law school when you're acting as a paralegal, knowing this approach can help you analyze cases as you take notes about cases that are important to you. These are oftentimes called case briefs. Case briefs are useful tools um, to use to help you understand it. But most of the time, they're just going to be for your personal use. No one else is going to care to see them. So they ought to follow a format that makes sense to you. If this makes sense to you, it may be something to run with. If it doesn't make sense to you, Find something that does. There's a lot of different uh, takes on this type of thing. This is a summary of the case that we were talking about briefly before that's in the textbook. And this breaks down um, the holding. In fact, this is using the same tools that we find over here. It's a more involved version of the IRAC method. Here, let me go back here. I have these slides out of order. I'm going to go back to 20. This breaks down um, the IRAC method for this particular case. And you can see there are two issues. Typically, if you're doing IRAC, you would have issue one, then the rule, 
for issue one, then the analysis for issue one, then the conclusion for issue one. And only then would you go to issue two, the rule for issue two, the analysis for issue two, the conclusion for issue two. So I kind of completed that. It's not exactly the way it's done, but um, that this is a very abbreviated example of what a case brief would look like. The in reality, case briefs are sometimes longer than the opinion. So the term brief is a little misleading. They, they aren't usually they're not as long, but they can be quite long things. Sometimes it's harder or takes more words to explain something uh, than it does to, for the original document. Let's go back and consider constitutional and statutory law. Up to this point, we've been talking about case law, and I'll be honest with you, case law is hard to find, and it certainly presents challenges in terms of reading. Statutory law is usually quite easy to find, although statutes are even sometimes more difficult to understand than cases. In fact, I would say usually they are. Of course, we have resources for federal, um, uh, federal constitution, federal code, as well as state. Um, the USDA is what we have in our library. They're kind of a maroon colored book. You can find it in Spring Creek Library. There are other resources, obviously, here. You can find the USC, which is the federal official statutory guide um, on uh, online. The USDA is annotated. It's a West publication. The annotations are editorial information that West has provided. Um, the USDA's annotations are primarily references to cases. So when you might have a statute about something, after the statute, you'll list cases that... Um, uh, cite the statute, as well as uh, maybe law review articles and other resources. So the USDA, with its annotations, is a very helpful tool for finding related cases and other materials. You can find a uh, recently written, uh, actually you can find statute, recently written case law, as well, but not here, you can't find that here. But this is where you can find statutes. Um, if you were to just type in text of statutes in Google or something, this will be like your first choice. It's a good tool to find. Now, you because our, our statutes are pretty well organized going through the different codes, you'll be able to usually find the statute that you're looking for. Um, but you're not going to have the benefit of a sophisticated index that you might if you were looking at um, a, a paper-bound version. In Texas, our book-bound version of Texas statutes is called Vernon. Let me try that up here. V E R N O N apostrophe S. They're black with gold lettering. Um, obviously, Mr. Vernon, I guess, used to be the publisher of this. Of course, now it's owned by West. West owns everything. Um, but they do they do have a lot of, of neat findings. If you're look, using the book version of either the USDA or Vernon, always, always, always check the pocket parts. If a new statute has been added or changed, or new cases have referenced that particular part of the statute, those will be in the pocket part. Um, as I said before, this is the official compilation, the USC, um, right under the USDA, that's the annotated version. Okay, example cases are provided. Um, in Texas, our statutes are organized by topic, so all the penal code, all the criminal laws are in the penal code. All the laws relating to families are in the family code. Uh, so they're organized in a way that makes it a lot easier to find. For the most part, I mean, still, sometimes there's a question, well, is that, you know, for example, domestic violence, would you find that in the penal code or would you find that in the family code? Uh, kind of a good question, not obvious what the answer would be. Here are all the titles of the U.S. code, uh, all the different categories. I'll give you an example. My practice, um, Title 29 is labor law. So that's where I would go if you're looking there. If you're doing some patent litigation, you'd go to Title 35. So this is a good organizational system to, to be aware of. Obviously, you have to commit these to memory, but if you uh, would, would look in the, probably in the front of the USDA, you'd find this table that gives this information. Let's consider for a second how we analyze statutes. There are lots of rules of construction, lots of, um, you know, guidelines, I guess you could say, for how you should look at a particular statute. Um, and we'll look at just a few of these to give you some perspective. The important thing about rules of construction is that some of the common sense rules that you and I use every day when we're speaking English don't apply when we're reading statutes. Statutes are very ungainly things. You can have a sentence in a statute that literally goes on for pages. 
And I don't mean one or two pages. I mean, it could be ten pages. It's all one sentence with lots of clauses, with lots of various uh, bullets and, and subgroups and all kinds of things. Really, it's not the type of thing that you sit down and start on you know, page 17 and read through to page 47 uh, without taking a break, without taking notes, without backtracking. It's not that type. It's not like reading a novel. So here are some examples of rules of construction, and these are ways of interpreting statutes um, so that they are less ambiguous. Specific provisions are given greater weight than general provisions. So the narrower the provision is, the more likely it is that the court will say, that's the one we're going to follow. It's not unusual for a statute to seem to contradict itself. For example, a statute might say, um, under all circumstances, um, spouses must, uh, provide uh, support for their spouse. Okay, that sounds like an ironclad rule. There's no single exception. But then there might be another provision that says um, while uh, spouses are legally separated, there is no need for um, a spouse to provide financial support for the other spouse. That's not the rule, by the way. I don't want you to think that's the rule in Texas. But let's imagine that were the rule. Well, that's a more specific provision. And so even though it seems to contradict the more general provision, the court would likely say, well, that's more specific. So we're going to treat that as an exception to that general rule. And in all other cases, we're going to apply the general rule, which says the spouse has to support another spouse. But in the sole exception of a legal separation, we're not going to apply that rule. Just so you know, in Texas, we don't have legal separation. But that's for another class to talk about. Recent provisions are given greater weight than earlier provisions. So let's say then earlier provision said, um, uh, uh, Spouse is required to to support a spouse even through the legal separation process, and that law was passed in 1957. But in 1994, the legislature said that a spouse is not required to support a spouse during the separation process unless the um, a spouse who needs support is medically disabled. Um, it seems to be a contradiction. Um, it seems like perhaps the older provision was, was revised or perhaps um, over, overruled by a legislative action, um, but the more recent provision is the one that is going to be applied, the one that was in 1994. One thing we don't need to statutes is to make them longer, and so as a result, most statutes are written as if everyone in the universe is male, which we know, you know isn't true because there's babies around, so we know somehow know that there's some females, but you wouldn't know that if you were looking in a statutory book because it sounds like it's only men running around. But if you were to say he or she, or male or female, constantly, a, a statute that has a sentence that's four pages long is suddenly six pages long, and that doesn't help anyone. So when you see a masculine pronoun, you ought to assume that it includes males and females, unless, of course, in some sense it doesn't make sense. If it's a section, for example, about proving paternity, okay, um, only men can be fathers, not women. So, um, so there are some times where that rule doesn't make sense. But in most cases, if they're, for example, referring to the rights of inmates, they might constantly say he, but of course there are female inmates too. And so you, you would, uh, in the proper case, think of it as being he or she. Singular nouns also include the, the plural form of a noun. So, for example, there might be some issue about when there's a child that was born to a marriage maybe having to do with the divorce proceedings. So the statute might talk about a child of the marriage, but there might be ten children from the marriage. Um, and so the court is going to use the singular, but it also includes the plural idea. And usually that works the other way, too. If the statute talks about children of the marriage, but there's only one child, well, of course, that, that rule that applies to children would apply to that child. You do need to know these. They're common sense ones, but Spend a you know minute or two looking these over to make sure you've kind of interpreted or incorporated their logic in your own head. Another one is the plain meaning rule. This sounds really good. I don't know how really helpful it is when courts are actually interpreting them. And the rule is, if the statute is clear on its face, if when you read the statute you're like, I know what this means, <clears throat> the court should not look any further. It should just take the ordinary, the plain meaning of the word, um, and apply it. Uh, sometimes when language is ambiguous, the court will say, well, um, let's read the legislative history to find out what the legislative intent is behind this. Maybe when we read what they were thinking, we'll suddenly get what they meant to say, even though they didn't do a very good job saying it. 
And you may be thinking, well, why would the legislature not do a good job saying something? There can be lots of reasons. This might have been a hard-fought battle, battle between one faction and another faction. It may have been settled in a smoke-filled room at 3 in the morning after lots of vigorous debate, and somebody just forgot a word. <clears throat> and, you know, somebody was crossing out one word and adding another word, and some other word got left off, or um, they were, you know, too sleepy to, to make sense of exactly the way this ought to be phrased. Um, or perhaps they worded it ambiguously because one faction wanted to uh, pre present to their constituency it means X, and the other faction wanted to present to their constituency it meant Y. And so they intentionally made it ambiguous. So there can be lots of different stories about why, but the court has to figure it out. If it's ambiguous, the court's going to look into the history. If it's not ambiguous, the court isn't going to look. So if the meaning is clear on its face, even if the legislative history indicates that that's not what the legislature intended, the plain meaning is going to rule. Now this sounds like a really helpful rule when I, when I heard it, but it really isn't because whether a statute has, is clear on its face is really a matter of opinion. Um, and so if the court says it's clear on its face, the court might be saying that because the court likes what it says on its face, and the court doesn't want to look at the legislative history because it doesn't like what the legislative history says. So it's kind of a, a not necessarily in practice as clean or as, as, a, as a good, a good a rule as it sounds in theory. But this is the rule, and you are also responsible for knowing this. Another thing I would say is read the statute as a whole. You may be directed to a particular part of a statute when you're um, uh, – uh, doing some research, but at least glance at the other sections because sometimes one section really fits with another section. And if you're just looking at one section in isolation, it may not make a lot of sense. And one thing that is really important is looking at the definition section. In many statutes, it's actually the first section of that larger um, section of, of the statute. Um, it may be actually in a different, in the number 101, section 101. But it could even be in a different place in the statute entirely. If you're looking at books, it could be in an entirely different volume. And the key here is, in the definition section, is that the definition the legislature adopted for a particular term may not be what its ordinary English meaning is. I mean, it may be broader, it may be narrower, it may just be more different. I mean, more, not more different, it may be different than what we ordinarily mean. And the definition provided in the statute is the definition you ought to work with. So if you are assuming that child means someone under the age of 18 um, when you're looking at the statute because that's what it means to you and what it would mean in everyday conversation with someone. But, when you, uh, but you might be very mistaken. Maybe the definition of the statute is someone under the age of 21 or somebody who is um, uh, uh, the, the a natural um, biological child of someone else of whatever age that person might be. So the, the person could be 50 years old and still be a child means that they are the biological descendant of someone else. So you really need to look at the definition um, in the section just to make sure it's meeting with what your common sense tells you the definition ought to be. Um, so look at the statute first, see if it's a definition. If not, you may want to turn to legal dictionaries, blacks or valentines, or maybe just an online dictionary to get a sense for the definition. A couple things to be careful about are the use of the terms and or or or. or or, if and is used, all of the requirements must be met. And many times you'll see a uh, sectional that's one, two, three, four, five. Many times there will be a colon after each one of these. So this one will end with a period. If you look at the penultimate one, the one right above the bottom one, and see is there an or or an and. If there's an or, it means that you only need one of these. This one, or this one, or this one, or this one, or this one. Keep in mind, though, this might be three pages apart. These might be long sections. What I like to do is find that penultimate one, see if it's an or, and then I will go back and add the ors. They won't be in the statute, but that helps me remember. And, of course, if they were ands, I would do that same process. But if you're reading this and you don't know whether this colon should be an or or an and, you are going to be messed up. You are not going to understand what the statute is saying. So go to that end. Find that so you know whether you're looking at ors or ands. Obviously, if it's or, you only need one of the requirements to be met. Then let's look at shall and may. In English, we, casual English, we sometimes use these words interchangeably, but in technical legal writing, they have different meanings. Shall means the action is required. If it says 
the um, uh, non-primary resident, excuse me, yeah, the non-primary resident conservator shall pay child support, it means no way around it, got to do it. If it says may, it means that can be one way of resolving it, but it's not the only way of resolving it. There's some discretion involved. So be aware of the distinctions between shall and may in legal writing. Um, previous judicial interpretation um, is going to give you examples of how cases have interpreted specific statutory provisions. And you can find those in annotated codes after the actual statute and a little bit, usually a snippet of, of legislative history, then they will go through a long list of cases. Sometimes the list of cases will be, you know, 100 pages, literally, lots and lots of pages, much longer than the actual statute is. And that will tell you what courts have done with that particular language. And then again, there will be some hints about legislative intent or legislative history. Those are harder to find, to be honest, they're in, in the cases. And of course, the, the goal here is to figure out why the legislature did what it did. And you can look at things like committee reports, debates and hearings, the congressional record. Um, in annotated code, it will list these items, but it won't contain the actual substance of the items. So it will tell you where to find it within the committee reports, within the debates, and within the hearings. Finally, we have a little bit about administrative law, regulatory law. The CFR is the Code of Federal Regulations. It is available online listing all the regulations of all federal agencies. And they are married up with the U.S. Code. So they're so all, for example, all labor agencies are going to be under Title 29. Within the CFR, there's going to be finding aids and indexes. And the most recent changes to the CFR will be in the Federal Register. And you can find that right here in the CFR update. And you can also, not in our library, but in other libraries, you'll find the Federal Register. So if regulations have just come out, of course you can find them online, um, but you can find them in little um, paper updates. Um, and here are some various finding references for administrative law. We already talked about loosely services, those, those three ring binders. Nowadays with the internet, not so important to have those tools. Here are some summaries. I'm going to go through these quicker. Um, pause on it if you need to spend more time to write down the information want to expose you to these. If you have questions, um, hopefully you've written them down and you can bring them to class and we will talk about them. Thanks so much for your attention. Have a wonderful day and I'll see you in class. Bye-bye.